Isn't it wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord, corporately? And we're going to talk about that this evening. I'm Pastor Wayne Hilsden. Been around for a while. Thank you, Pastor Chad, for letting me preach tonight. It's an awesome privilege. It really is. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're in this place today. By the presence of your Holy Spirit <clears throat> around us, in us, expressed through us, Help me, Lord, to deliver your word as you would deliver it. May you be glorified. May our ears be open to hear what the Spirit would say. May we be ready to change if we need to change tonight. In Yeshua's name, amen. Well, we're in a series that we've been doing for the last couple of months called The Greatest of All Time, G-O-A-T, GOAT for short. Yeshua is the greatest of all time. We learn from the book of Hebrews that we've been studying that he's greater than the prophets, greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than Joshua, greater than Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. He's the mediator of a greater covenant. He entered a greater sanctuary. Yeshua made a greater sacrifice. And I'm going to share with you tonight that Yeshua's body, when it's gathered especially is the greatest body. Many metaphors describe the community of God's people. It can be the temple. It can be a household of faith, a flock with a shepherd. But in the New Testament, there's a reference to believers as the body of Messiah more than a dozen times. So I'm going to use that metaphor tonight. The world refers to entities like the body politic or the legislative body or the judicial body, but the body of Messiah is far greater. As Yeshua himself declared in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. You and I are born again individually. We've entrusted our lives to Yeshua as our Savior, our Lord, but once saved, we are no longer just individuals. God incorporated and attached us to a larger body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 and 14 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks. Romans 12, 4 and 5 puts it this way. We, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Something is seriously wrong then when members of Yeshua's body detach themselves. I mean, what would a body be like if our vital organs were no longer in our body? Yet tragically, some believers think they can live for God without fellowship with other believers. That is a fantasy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 21 and 22, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. If you're part of this community, King of Kings, I need you. And believe it or not, you need me. This brings me to the letter to the Hebrews, our focus for the past few months. And at the end of chapter 10, I know that Pastor Chad has already covered chapter 10, but he's let me go back. At the end of that chapter, we get something new, in the series at least. Beginning at verse 23, we read these words. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. This is a prophetic, urgent call in the latter days before the return of the Lord to keep on gathering together. Based on these verses, here's where I'm going with this message. I'm going to show us how Yeshua's body gathered in some ways is the greatest body of all, kind, all time. I'll show you how healthy gathering in Yeshua's presence produces some good things. Number one, a healthy gathering together produces perseverance. We see that in verse 23. Healthy gathering produces growth in love. 
the middle of verse 24. Healthy gathering produces good works. Verse 24 of the last part of the verse. And then I'm going to show how producing these things happen in a healthy gathering when we take others into consideration. The beginning of verse 24. When we stir up one another. Verse 24, the middle part of the verse. And finally, we exhort one another in the second part of verse 25. So the writer to the Hebrews knows that the closer we get to the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's return, as the king and judge, some believers will forsake the assembling of themselves with other believers. And that is so dangerous. For before the day of the Lord, we have this prophetic warning also in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. In Matthew chapter 24, in verse 12, the place where Yeshua is giving signs to his disciples of what it will be like before he returns. And we read this in verse 12, and then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness abounding, the love of many will grow cold. Now, I've been a pastor for more than 40 years, 46 years to be exact. And I can't remember a time in my time as a believer when people are so easily offended. I don't know when there's a time that there's been more backbiting, judgmentalism than there is right now. Indeed, the love for one another is growing cold. We've become like spiritual porcupines, so quick to raise our quills at the slightest bump or disagreement. And easily offended people tend to pull away from fellowship or they go from one place to another till they get offended again and move on. And I've watched parents showing up maybe once a month or once every couple of months, and that's a phenomenon I think since COVID. These are people that believe they're fully committed to a local congregation, but as they tend to show up less and less and their children are not regularly catching up with friends in the congregation, and developing those social skills and their faith in the Messiah. Those children grow up and they end up falling away. I see it over and over again. And sometimes the parents fall away as well. These are signs of what it would be like before the day of the Lord. And sadly, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, before the day of the Lord's return, this will not come unless the falling away comes first. So we should not be shocked. It was predicted, but may you and I never fall into that trap. So what does healthy gathering in Yeshua's presence produce? Number one, healthy gathering produces perseverance. No wonder the writer to the Hebrews gives us this warning about neglecting our gathering together. Why he feels the need to exhort us in verse 23. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. The phrase hold fast in Greek means to continue to believe and practice, to continue to follow. The Amplified Bible translates this part of the verse saying, let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope without wavering. Does gathering together help us hold fast, hold tightly, and persevere in our faith? Well, it was during the first congregation in Jerusalem when they gathered. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. I am convinced that one of the most powerful ways to strengthen our faith and persevere in our faith is to experience God's manifest presence when we are gathered together. I don't know about you, but as the worship team was leading us, I sensed more of the presence of the Lord. I, I sensed he was in the room. And I 
find that it happens most often when I'm gathered with fellow believers. It's more potent than any apologetic argument for the existence of God or the truth of his word. When you know God is in the room, there's no doubt about is there a God? It's like the difference between watching a sunset on your phone versus standing on the beach as the sun melts into the ocean. Both are real, but one is an experience that changes you. Ann and I were traveling recently, and uh, we were in a place where we, it was rare to be able to get to a local congregation, but we were able to watch online. Of course, our primary watching online is this service here, and welcome to all of you who are watching online right now. And, uh, but there was a Sunday where we could actually go to a local congregation, but we didn't know the pastor. We didn't know what it was like. We just walked into the door. And I can tell you, as soon as I walked in, I sensed the presence of God. And joy leapt in my heart. Peace penetrated my being. Somehow, in-person gathering with the saints makes a huge difference. Now, I'm not saying that you who are watching online this evening are second-class citizens because you're not in the room with us. But can I encourage you with this? Keep watching online, but wherever you are in the world watching, would you gather with the saints nearby in your own local congregation? Don't solely look to us for your inspiration gather together in person whenever you can. There's a few amens here. I don't, any amens online? Send me an emoji. <laughs> you know, technology will never make it possible for us elders to pray, to lay on our hands, anoint you with oil for your healing. I don't think the technology is coming for that. Somehow we need to be in person for that. The book of Acts is a historical record of how in-person gathering as the body of Messiah can be a powerful means to experience God's manifest presence and change us in powerful ways. We read this in chapter 2 of Acts, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here we see that that 10-day prayer meeting in the upper room where believers were gathered in unity, waiting for the promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit and power, resulted in a manifest presence in their midst with wind, tongues of fire, the filling of every believer with the Holy Spirit. That's what a 10-day prayer meeting could do. <laughs> now, I don't think for a moment that what happened on the day of Pentecost was just a one-off, never-to-occur-again experience of God's presence. It happened again later. We read in Acts chapter 4, and verse 31, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I've been in meetings where the Holy Spirit has shown up with great power, and my heart was changed. My heart was warmed. I got more boldness, more confidence in my faith, and the desire to share it, even if there'd be opposition. And that's what happened to those early believers as they gathered together. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. How? By being in the corporate presence of the Lord. It'll change us. Yeshua says this when revealing the signs preceding the day of his coming, but he who endures to the end will be saved. It's not enough to begin well, you've got to end well. How many of you 
want to finish well. Those who endure to the end, those who persevere until the end will be saved. Has the fear of God come upon you? In just sharing those truths, it should. How durable is our faith? Will it endure when we are in the last of the last days? And who knows, we might be in them right now. Number two, healthy gathering produces growth in love. It's here in verse 23, the second part of the verse. Sorry, verse 24 of our text. And let us consider one another to stir up love. Let us consider one another to stir up love. We need to regularly gather with other believers to grow, particularly in love. This is what we read in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 and following. It says that, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head the Messiah, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we need to be with one another, each of us doing our share in our community to grow, especially in love. In the same passage, there are particular individuals that God has called who have unique gifts that are necessary for these healthy gatherings and better equipping us to love one another. In verse 11 of the same text, Ephesians 4, it says, and he, that is Yeshua, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. I was discussing this yesterday with some people who wondered if home groups are all we need, and thus gathering in more significant numbers is unnecessary. Well, one of the things I said is that according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, the early believers in Jerusalem got together in their homes, and that's healthy but it also says they gathered at the temple. So it's the cell and the celebration. But let me say this. If you have eight to 12 people in your home fellowship, and among that number are an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, you're doing very well. Maybe you don't, don't need to gather in a big number. But uh, finding a home group with an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher is about as rare is finding a parking spot right in front of the Temple Mount on a holiday. <laughs> but it's not just these so-called five-fold leaders we need to grow in love as we gather, but we need all of us to do our share in helping each other grow in our love for God and for one another. So I've shared that healthy gathering produces perseverance in faith. Healthy gathering produces growth in love. And now, as our text tells us at the end of our text, Hebrews 10, 25, healthy gathering produces good works. The gathering of believers is not a spectator sport. We need the corporate body of believers to be equipped in order to produce good works. While we also need to do good works among the unbelieving world, Galatians 6, 10 reminds us, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, there are many in this room, and I commend you this evening, and I've done it over the years, where you work in a, in a ministry that's reaching out and helping in very practical ways and bringing the good news to this nation among unbelievers, whether it's among Jewish people, Arabs, and others that are part of this nation. But I want to say this, I've noticed that it's really hard for people who work in these ministries to also gather with believers in a local congregation. I'm not saying you've left the faith, but I am saying this, that just being with people who you're working with is not the same as gathering in a local congregation with people from all kinds of different walks and doing all kinds of different things for God. And it's a great place 
to learn how to love people that aren't like you. Isn't that the real test of our love? Again, I want to commend you for what you're doing. And now I've come to the more practical part of my message. I'm going to explain to you that when we gather in the Lord's presence, in order to help produce perseverance, growth in love, and good works, there are three things that we need to do. Number one, we need to take others into consideration. What's it say in verse 24 of our text? Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider one another to stir up love and good works. The word consider here means to be concerned about or to care for. How could we ever help each other when we gather to persevere in faith, to grow in love and help produce good works if we don't care about the different people God has surrounded us with? In Hebrews 3.1, the same Greek word for consider is used. It says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, the Messiah Yeshua. Now, when we're gathered, we worship him, so we consider him. We think about him. He's, he's in our very midst. But how often when we're in a worship gathering are we thinking about others that God providentially has put near us in the room? How much do we consider the fact that they're there and they're not there for by accident, but they're there because God has placed them there in that gathering, just as he's placed you in the gathering. We often treat a congregation like a spiritual drive through Grab what we need and go. But God designed it to be more like a family dinner where we linger, share, and truly see each other. Wouldn't it be awesome if during our gathering in a home group or our discipleship classes during the week, or even in our Sunday evening service, that we would ask the Lord if he'd have us go and say hi, to get to know somebody that we've never met before and make them feel like they're actually seen, that we consider them. There are a lot of people in our world who have rejection complexes. If somebody would just pay attention that they're there and speak with them and listen to a bit of their story, it would make a huge difference. Now, secondly, besides considering one another, verse 24, the second part of the verse says, stir up one another. Here's what it says. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Stir up is translated into other versions as arouse or spur on or inspire. How do you inspire someone to develop more love and do more good? I don't think it's by commanding them to do so. I think modeling what we hope to see in others will inspire them to do the same. In the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10, we see how Abraham's faith inspired generations by being a model of someone who persevered, looking forward to God's promises. Mary, who took time out of her busy schedule to sit at Yeshua's feet, received praise from Yeshua for her actions. He said, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. She modeled and, is, and thus inspired us to sit at Yeshua's feet. Paul tirelessly served others, planting congregations, mentoring leaders like Timothy and Titus, writing letters that continue to inspire us, stir us up to do good works, stir us up to love more. And each of us, by living a life of fiery passion for the Lord and for his body, will spur many to persevere, to grow in love and do good works. Think of a campfire for a moment. The log burning alone will eventually go out but put it together with other burning logs and the fire grows stronger. And that's what happens when we gather, when our individual flames of faith come together and strengthen one another. And a fiery passion for the Lord grows and inspires, stirs up others to become more like Yeshua. And then thirdly, 
way to help produce perseverance, growth and love and good works, and that is by exhorting one another. Modeling things is excellent, inspires, but it's not enough. Hebrews 10.25 says in the last verse of our text, not forsaking the assemblies, assembling of ourselves together as you see the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. The Greek word for exhort means to encourage someone to do something or be something. But in most biblical examples, it's stronger than that. It's, it's to appeal, it's to urge, and in some cases to insist on. And Paul uses the same Greek word in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you, brethren. He doesn't just encourage. I mean, he's pretty insistent. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And in the book of Hebrews, back in chapter 3, verse 13, we read this, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, many of us get uncomfortable when we are spoken to so directly. It rubs us the wrong way. But how many of you know that we'll never reach our full potential in following the Lord without fellow believers being our spiritual sandpaper? Spiritual sandpaper may not feel comfortable, but it's what God uses to smooth out our rough edges and make us shine for his glory. Just as a rough diamond needs other diamonds to polish it, to brilliance, we need the friction of fellowship to reveal our true beauty in the Messiah. Don't you love friction? <laughs> Somehow God uses it. I, I think of the, the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, a debate, a discussion, and it was pretty heated. If you read the text again, you'll notice that. Trying to decide, can Gentiles become part of the kingdom of God without becoming Jewish first and following all of the, the commandments and the traditions, etc. If you can't debate one another in the body of Messiah, then you are still immature in your faith. We need to be able to discuss things at a deep level and risk sometimes offending our brother, but never intentionally. But how many of you know that even when you don't when you try to avoid offending, it easily happens. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Ouch, ouch. Iron is not very gentle. Proverbs 26, 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Here's an exhortation for you, but don't be offended, okay? Don't be a spiritual lone wolf. Wolves may look majestic, but they rarely survive. Be part of the pack where we hunt together, grow together, and strengthen each other for the days ahead. Some of us avoid spiritual correction like a cat avoids a bath. But just like a cat, we're better off after the uncomfortable experience. Ephesians 4, which we've already read parts of, will help us avoid hurting one another in exhorting. It says in verses 15 and 16, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, the Messiah, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. When we speak the truth, sometimes a difficult truth, potentially offending truth, may our hearts be full of love. May we be willing to put ourselves, as it were, in their shoes, hearing what you're about to say. How would you want to hear it? Say it with a genuine heart of love. Chances are much better that you won't offend, but you'll help the iron sharpen the iron. This can't happen just in the larger gathering on a Sunday night. It happens in small groups, one-on-one. -on -one. 
where and when we say these things is so crucial. Don't bring a word of correction at 7.30 in the morning when that person hasn't had their coffee yet. Where you say it, not where other people are going to listen in <laughs> and hear these words. We need to keep our confidentiality. So we've seen that healthy gatherings in his presence produce three great things. Perseverance in our faith, growth in our love, and the fruit of good works. In these last days, when many are falling away and love is growing cold, we need these things more than ever. The writer to the Hebrews has given us three practical ways to make our gatherings truly transformative. When we truly consider the people around us, stir each other up through our example, but also through exhortation. We will see ourselves and others press on toward growth and maturity in Yeshua. So let me challenge you this week, wherever you're with other believers, whether in a home group or this service next Sunday or a discipleship on Wednesday or wherever you're with other believers, don't just slip in and slip out. Choose at least one person you don't know well and take time to consider them. Learn their name. Hear some of their story. Let the Lord show you how you might encourage them. And if you know everybody in the room, find someone that the Lord would impress upon you needs to hear something from your lips to help them become more like Yeshua. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst, Yeshua reminds us. As we see the day approaching, let us not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Father, thank you that you've allowed us to become members of your body. In these days when so many are pulling away in isolation, suffering anxiety and depression in their isolation, help us to draw many more closer together to join your body. Help us to be intentional in our gatherings, seeing one another, stirring each other up, and sharpening each other with love and grace. I pray in your holy name. Amen. God bless you.